you go and sit with a private employer and you discuss what you're going to do, work, and let's say, just for simplicity, I'm going to get paid $20 an hour. At that moment, Marx says, if you're going to be paid by an employer $20 an hour, the following statement must be true. During that hour, your labor produces more for the employer that he sells at the end of the day than $20 worth. There has to be in it, here we go, something for him. You have to produce more in every hour than you get paid. Otherwise, this system doesn't work. Those of you who think that in a capitalist system, you're never going to work for anybody who doesn't pay you what you're worth, you don't understand the system you're in. That is never going to happen, but that's how this system works. So that when you go home at the end of a workday and you feel vaguely ripped off, it's because you are. Yet another day, yet another smug communist academic. This idea that the owner of the business, the capitalist, exploits the labor of the worker and appropriates the surplus value is false. Because this labor theory of value doesn't understand how value is generated. Let's say you work at a hamburger chain cleaning tables and you're paid $20 an hour. This doesn't mean that you generate value worth more than $20 an hour. In fact, Cleaning tables doesn't even produce the product, it doesn't make the hamburgers. What it does is that it makes the restaurant cleaner, more hygienic, and thus it's a reason for customers to choose that restaurant rather than a dirty one. And of course, cleanliness is not the only reason to pick a restaurant, there can be many reasons. The taste is important, the location of the restaurant is important, whether the prices are reasonable, whether you have good marketing, and so on and so forth. All of this combined raises the demand for the product, and the cooks bring in the actual supply, the burgers. The managers try to run things as efficient as possible, etc. And only with all of this combined, you can sell a product, finally acquiring the value. Things don't have inherent value in them. If I was to produce a bad product, like a book that you can't read, there will be no demand, and the book will have zero value, regardless of my labor while writing it. So the cleaner produces nothing by his own labor, since the demand is not just for clean tables, but the overall experience. Neither does the cashier produce any value, nor the manager, nor the boss. But with all personnel combined, the company can sell the product. Now let's take into consideration that the owner of the business is the one who invested in the business. He bought the appliances and tools necessary to run the restaurant, and he chose and employed the personnel. So how is it wrong that he gets a bigger share of the profit? Because without the entrepreneurship, the labor doesn't have value. You need the restaurant if the cleaner wants to earn a living. Economy is not a zero-sum game. Thanks to the capitalist, value is generated where previously it didn't exist. If not for capitalism, there is no incentive to take the risk in creating a business. The entrepreneur invests because he hopes to make more money than a cleaner. Otherwise, both the capitalist and the cleaner would be in poverty. So how is this evil? What's bad about this? You may see that in discussions like this, Marxists say that, oh, but it was Adam Smith who came up with the labor theory of value. Marx only expanded on it. But this is not really true. In The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says, the real price of everything, what everything really costs to the man who wants to acquire it, is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. What everything is really worth to the man who has acquired it, and who wants to dispose of it or exchange it with someone else, is the toil and trouble which it can save to himself, and which it can impose upon other people. So no, Smith's theory has nothing to do with the labor spent in producing a commodity. It speaks only of the labor that can be commanded or saved at present. But even if it was Adam Smith that came up with the labor theory of value as Marxists know it, that's not relevant. Then Adam Smith will be false when it comes to this. Anyhow, I wrote my ideas to a few subreddits a couple days ago. The one on r slash capitalism versus socialism became a huge discussion, with nearly over 200 replies, which I didn't expect at all. But it was amusing as hell, and I'd like to go through some of them. First, the funny responses. So this guy, a left communist, says that he doesn't think surplus value is inherently bad, and he gives an analogy. Just as high-fat, high-calorie diet has expanded the human brain, good, it also leads to all sorts of diseases and bodily disruption, bad. 
Then an ANCAP joins in and absolutely derails the conversation into a discussion about diet. And I just love this. I just love how productive this is and how relevant it is to the original discussion. Really, sir, I salute you. Re organizers of capital get a wage. Re So the communist responds, we don't want wages at all. I'm hiring in that case. <laughs> That's my capitalist. <laughs> if you couldn't tell. <laughs> and there's and there's this one. This is a moderator from R slash communism one oh one. You are very, very far away from being able to criticize the law of value in a coherent way. Use the search function for this topic and go to debate communism if you want to argue. Also, a really simple life tip. If you think you have debunked an economic theory with 100 plus years of history that has worked on by millions with the first thing that pops into your head, you're basically delusional. Be more humble. Get a good intro to Marxist political economy and just fucking read it. It might take some days or weeks, but it will be a decent foundation to know what the hell you're supposedly debunking. Wow, Mr. Moderator, here's a really simple life tip. If you believe in an economic theory with 100 plus years of history of starving millions to death, you're basically delusional. Be more humble, get a good intro to actual economics, and just fucking read it. Entrepreneurship and risk are spooks. I want their fucking property, so I'm going to take it, says the guy who uses ANCAP's flooded my country as his flair. And here's a discussion about whether value comes from labor. The libertarian says, objectively speaking, labor doesn't exist at all. It's subjectively perceived. Then, objectively, nothing exists. Everything's a subjective perception of the unknowable true reality, which we use spooks to model and predict. <laughs> and that's why a market anarchists, nothing exists. There were also better quality replies. This guy says, in your example of the diner, you say that all of the people working together is what creates the value that is used to pay wages, buy, produce, etc. I would ask, why should one specific one of them get to choose how to use it all? Well, if the business is owned by one specific person, then naturally only he gets to decide how to use it. If you don't like it, you can save your money and invest, and you can buy or create your own business. If you still don't like it, and you think your boss is appropriating what you should be earning, you can start a co-op with your colleagues, because apparently just the workers alone is enough to run the business. This is wide open to corruption, just like any other political dictatorship in history. Not really. In dictatorships, you don't have the option to choose to abstain from the state. You don't even have the right to refuse giving them your money. But in a free market, you can say, I don't like this business, it's corrupt, it has bad business ethics, so I'm not gonna give them my money. Which is what happened to United Airlines. Being a jerk as a company is actually against the company's self-interest. Only in big banks and big business this doesn't apply. With the whole bailouts and 2008 crisis and all. And that is the fault of big government. Since the state has the power to bail those banks out, the bankers can take advantage of this power. And naturally they do it, why shouldn't they? Power leads to corruption, not the other way around. If all the people who create the value were to be the ones who decided on how to control it, i.e. they were equal or close to equal partners in the decision-making process, then it would be far fairer in my mind than the workplaces we see today. Okay, then you can create your co-op anytime and see if democracy runs effectively. But, you say, the capitalist took all of the risk creating the business. Well, yeah, I guess so, of, but not really. As soon as the capitalist hired an employee, they shared the risk of the business. If it fails, then the capitalist will lose both money and at least part of their livelihood. But their employee will lose everything. They, they rely on the workplace to provide a wage to them. And another guy replied to this and said, What you're saying doesn't make any sense. The worker has made very little investment in their job. They can go and get another job in it at any time. If the company fails, the employee continues to get paid until the very last paycheck and can then seek another job elsewhere. And he's right. Employees can 
only get paid in a job. They can't lose money. Capitalists can because they invest the money. So if the business fails, the money invested will be gone, resulting in a net loss. The employees will only maybe have lost a better job offer. And even then, they will not result in a net loss. They can only earn money. The question presumes it's even real. The concept is flawed. There is no value from labor at all. Labor doesn't, as if by magic, create value. There is no such thing as objective value. And workers don't create value through their labor. And yeah, I agree with this guy pretty much. Value is subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, look at this. This shitty drawing that I did in two minutes, which requires law labor, could have immense value to a 12-year-old, while it has zero value to me now. And the actual Mona Lisa, which requires heck of a lot more labor, could have immense value to me, while it has none to the 12-year-old. There isn't a fixed objective value. Individuals place value subjectively. And basically, if the value of a product is lower than its price, I'll buy it. If a product's price is higher than how much I value it, I want that. That's basically how economy works. Tell me one thing that has value but does not require any labor at all in a strict sense. The rain. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, the, the beauty of nature doesn't require any labor to exist. It's there, it's for free, and pretty much everyone values it. And this one really made me think. There was a link to this video which compared what Americans think as the ideal wealth distribution. What they think is the wealth distribution and the actual wealth distribution. They also point out that the CEOs are paid as much as 380 times as the average employee. And yeah, that's a, that's a good point. He says that's why leftists believe they're stealing this money. Okay, but this, this I can't agree with. It can't be stealing if the employee agrees to it. I mean, by definition, if there is a mutual voluntary contract between the employee and the employer, then that's not stealing. But based on these statistics, I, I see your point. I don't think a CEO deserves that much money. But again, if the employees feel like their bosses are stealing from them, why don't they just start their co-op and take the profit for themselves? If, for some reason, the team of employees are not enough to start that business, then doesn't that mean that the capitalist has something that the collective of these employees don't have? And that could justify the boss taking most of the profits, wouldn't it? I don't necessarily hold this position, I'm just playing the devil's advocate on this one. And also, I don't understand why leftists also hold the position that you should import low-skilled workers from the third world and you should have open borders and so on. Because when you do that, you pull the wages of the worker even lower. If you really care about the worker, you should oppose lowering their wages, shouldn't you? You should oppose the mass immigration. It seems to me that the left really doesn't care about the worker, they just hate the rich. And this one was another great answer by the communist side. He says, these are the following issues with overcompensating such activities, the capitalists. Point one, quite frankly, the capitalist is usually the only one who's even capable of making such investments, due to the great mass of laborers not owning much more than their own muscle. Not really. Look at someone like Warren Buffett. He literally started out by selling, quote, chewing gum, Coca-Cola bottles, or weekly magazines door-to-door. -door. And then he invested that money, and in 28, he became the richest person in the world. He's, ob he's obviously an extreme example, but still, he is an example that proves you can achieve great wealth with smart investment. Point two. Capitalists invested money in their enterprise once and expects to receive profit forever. Laborers show up to work every day. It's not entirely clear why the former should be compensated evenly with the latter. I already argued some answer to this, but another point is that, because without the capitalists' investment, there is no enterprise, while laborers can be substituted. Therefore, capitalists are valued more than workers, and naturally they're compensated more too. When we have more entrepreneurs and less laborers, the worth of laborers will rise and they will be paid much more. I mean, look at China. 
There are so many low-skilled workers that they're worth nothing in society. And it's so bad that you need to have child labor in the family or you will starve. Point three. There were taverns and bakeries and breweries literally thousands of years before capitalism. It's the height of naivety to imagine that nothing would happen and people would all happily starve to death in the absence of a few bright captains of the in industry to tell everyone else what to do. The taverns and bakeries weren't communist or socialist. They weren't capitalist either in the modern sense. But the voluntary trade between individuals is the basis of capitalism. And so they were closer to capitalism than communism. In capitalism, you don't have, quote, few bright captains of the industry. In fact, capitalism opposes that. It's communism that has few political leaders, or theoretically, the people, that dictate what everyone else needs to do. And capitalism says, no, with free enterprise, the people are better off. Let's get rid of these governments and the people that tell you what kind of business you should run. So yeah, I think that's enough for now, but there are many, many more posts which make an interesting read, but I can't go through all of them in just one video, but the link is in the description if you want to take a look for yourself. Subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.